Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's nice to see you again. Um, I'm glad you guys all made it safe, made it sound. Um, I'm happy to see each and every one of you for sure. Um, if you guys remember last week, um, we did the lightning round of Revelation. Um, so uh, I feel it was important to go over um, because we had been away from it for so long. Uh, no, we hadn't gathered in six plus weeks, almost eight weeks, I think, at that point. Um, so a very quick and very rushed overview of Revelation. Again, it's not super all-inclusive, but since we were gathering for the first time and um, we're actually recording it, I figured it would have been nice that people kind of understood where we came from. Um, they might have to watch it at half speed, but they, they will be able to at least understand of how we got here. Uh, my dad said, he was like, I was out of breath for you. And I'm like, I know, I'm gassed. I was, it was like I had ran a marathon. Um, so that brings us into where we are today in Revelation chapter 6. We've gotten to the end of chapter 5 where we see the proclamation of who the Lamb is. We got to see the beautiful... Um, understanding that it was, he stood a lamb as it had been slain and how beautiful and I mean we could talk for years about how beautiful that just phrase is stood a lamb as it had been slain uh, conquering sacrifice and that's what he wants us to to be um, to be known as um, we see that there are just uh, beautiful after beautiful examples of who he is and how the lamb and the, the father are considered equal that we see the equal glory given to them he's given the document the the sealed with seven seals and now he is sitting and saying now we can open them and now we're going to open the seven seals and now we're going to get into what the seven seals mean and what they uh, represent and how they are portrayed um, so does anybody remember, and we went over it very briefly, and then I figured we're just kind of going to start over on the seven seals again. Does anybody remember where these, uh, where this portion of scripture is talked about before? And who talks about it? Does anybody remember? Because it's, there's a couple places that might mention some other things, but there's one where this is very, pretty much laid out. Um, Hint, it's usually the, it's about who the Bible's about. Yes, me? No, it's not an Exodus. That's, it's okay. I want people to, nope, it's not Daniel. It's, it must be Jesus. Usually, this is one of the times where people can say the general, Jesus said it, and I would say, yeah, actually, this is, this is right. Um, in Matthew 24. Um, so we'll go over there because we're going to go over some of the parallels. We'll read Matthew 24 and then read Revelation chapter 6 and see how these things coincide. That um, the disciples come and a ask Christ a very blunt question and he just goes, okay. You know, you have not because you asked not and you asked. So here you go. Um, Matthew 24 is the Olivet Discourse. Um, they talk about the, they might have been asking more about the, their current circumstances, but Christ basically gave them the overview of everything that's going to happen. So in Matthew chapter 24, we'll, we'll read to the first 13 verses. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto him, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be one there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming at the end of the world? So, he basically comes to the temple, one of the most grandiose uh, things they had around at the time, was like, and Christ said, you know, this is just going to all be torn down. So, the disciples, I think, ask an innocent question of saying, well, when is it going to get torn down? And, you know, when you, when you come back, what, what's going to happen at the end of the world? And Christ lays it out for them. And he says, And Jesus answered and said in verse 4 unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. 
and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So, it's a very uh, pointed view of what's going to happen. And we're going to see that this lines up exactly with Revelation chapter 6. Matthew 24 is a basically Revelation chapter 6, just before it was written again. It's pretty awesome to look at, actually. It's one of those things where you can take and see, pretty much verse by verse, these seals. Um, so in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, it starts and it says, And I saw the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So, we're going to start there, and it's going to be very important that we understand some very things. Um, it starts with the noise of thunder uh, in verse 1. The noise of thunder pretty much always predates judgment in the Bible. Anytime there's thunderings and lightnings or those sort of things, it's not usually a happy time for the other party. It's usually indicative of God's power. Um, so understand that this is not a happy portion for the people. Um, then we get into verse 2 and it says, I behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So, very important, who is this white horse rider? It is, it's very, very important that we know who the difference is. This is the Antichrist. So it's, um, and it's not to be, because we know that in Revelation 19, Christ comes on a white horse with a crown as well. So people have and have mistaken this as this is Christ. It is very important to know this is not Christ. The crowns they are given are two different things. If you look at Revelation chapter 19 real quick, just so I can prove to you that it's a different um, it is a different writer. Revelation 19 verse 12, um, his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Um, he had a clothing dipped in vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. We clearly know that this is um, Christ. But the crown that they are given, both of the crowns, there's two different names for crowns here. Uh, Revelation chapter six is uh, six. Sorry, Revelation chapter six is Stephanos, which is a victor's crown. So just kind of like a crown for achievements, almost like a medal. So it's not as uh, it shows authority over a certain region, but it doesn't necessarily mean a king. It doesn't mean someone who has uh, inherent power. This power was awarded to him. This power was given to him in a manner. So, as you look in Revelation 19, the word for crown there is diadema. So we know the diadem. This, the, Christ is wearing the diadem in chapter 19 which is a kingly crown. This is a crown meant for someone of immense importance and power. So, we see that the writer here is very different. He went forth and was conquering and to conquer. So we see this false Christ, right? That's what the Antichrist is, is a false Christ. So if you go back to Matthew, so I'm going to ask you to keep your finger in Matthew 24 from now on because we're going to be bouncing back and forth. Um, Matthew chapter four, 24, verses 4 and 5 says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. 
it's very easy to confuse these two. So he says, first of all, there's going to be a false Christ. There's going to be someone who shows up saying, who looks and acts like you think I would. He's, he's even wearing a crown. He's conquering. He's winning things. But it's not me. So Matthew 24, 4, and 5 match up with verses 1 and 2 in Revelation 6. They say there's going to be first a false Christ. As we go forth, um, verse 6 in Matthew 24 says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. If we go into... Uh, Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, we see, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went on another horse that was red, and power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given to him great sword. So wars. I mean, they are killing one another. We see that the red horse pretty much means war. We see that, um, and again, Mima, I think, was mentioning that there's a Old Testament part. Uh, it's in Zechariah 1, 7 through 17, is where some of these horses are mentioned before. Um, so, Mima was close. She was just from Exodus. She just misspoke. She meant Zechariah. Um, you're welcome. Um, so, we see that in Matthew 24, verse 6, matches up with Revelation 3 and 4. Which says, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And then when another horse was red and uh, power given to him that sat there on to take peace from the earth and they should kill one another. And they were given him a great sword. We know swords are meant to conquer. Swords are meant for war. Um, we're going to slow down within the next coming weeks and go over these individually. So I'm just trying to show how this was predated. So don't worry, we're not going to just skip over these things and go really quickly. Um, we see the third seal happen in 5 and 6. And he says, When he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see that thou hurt not the oil and wine. So what does that mean? I want, it doesn't really say exactly what it is, but you kind of have to extrapolate it. My, uh, my father said famine. There is intense shortage of food here. The balances aren't necessarily for um, regular monetary. When we think of balances, sometimes my brain goes straight to like judgment and uh, uh, I forgot the name of the the. Like at the Supreme Court, they have the balance. Yeah, the chest, the chestus, justice. justice. I'm sorry. The ju I, that's what I'm thinking of. But it's actually talking about bartering. It's actually talking about at a uh, a market where now they were instead of just saying, oh, it's two for one. They were actually going by weight. They're saying you you need to understand that it, th if you're counting money by weight in this instance, that's that's a big deal. Because you know, if I have three loaves of bread, how much actual coinage or actual like physical money am I going to have to use to buy this? And it's going to have to be almost equal. They're, they're saying it's going to be so expensive to buy food here. So we're talking about famine. Um, in Matthew 24, the first part of verse 7 says, For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. He very clearly says famines. And then he goes on to say, and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places, which goes into the next writer. And it says, and when, I, and when he had opened the fourth seal in verse 7 of Revelation 6, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth um, we see that the earthquakes and so the pestilences earthquakes in diverse places in matthew 24 i think are just a more uh, uh, descriptive term of what's going to happen. This is the power that he's given. This is the pale horse. This is death. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I know, at least in my line of work, I can 
walk into a room and see what someone looks like and say they look like death and usually that means they're extremely pale and so that's what the pale horse is uh, meaning it's not a fact of his normal coloration it's the color of death it's you you know it when you see it you know what death looks like here so uh, verses 7 and 8 of the pale horse go into verses 7 and 8 of Matthew 24 um, it's very very close how just how he, much power death is giving him uh, is given to him death and hell followed with him in verse 8 and power was given to him and the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth um, not a good time again this goes back to the thunderings that we get to see um, in verses 9 through 11 of uh, Revelation 6 we get to see the fifth seal and when he had opened the fifth seal I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held and they cried with a loud voice saying how long O Lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth and white robes were given unto every one of them and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that they should be killed as they were should be fulfilled so in verses 9 and 11 of Revelation chapter 6 we go to Matthew 24 verse 9 um, and it says then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake so we get to see the Saints here exactly like in Revelation chapter 6 are being killed are being upheld, are being uh, hunted down. And then we see them given white robes, but Jesus is like, oh, if you take my name, you are going to be killed in this time. Um, in verses 12 through 17, basically the sixth seal um, is just chaos it's just the end it's getting towards the end of just this is just what things are going to happen um, in Revelation 6 it says in verse 12 and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell into the earth even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the great man and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty man and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? Um, so we see in verse 10 and 13 in, Rev in Matthew 24, the chaos that comes and it says, And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he shall endure to the end. The same shall be saved. So we see they he kind of goes on a more personal level in Matthew 24 of what the individuals are going to see but we get to see the cause of it in Revelation chapter 6 why are people hating one another why are they love wax cold why does um, these things happen is because of the you could almost call it anarchy or the the lawlessness that will happen because of the immense um, try uh, the tribulations that the world is going to go through I mean this is revelation we're talking about we could start to talk about tribulations <laughs> this is what what is going to happen to the world um, so it I just thought it would be very interesting that you guys would want to see the part in Matthew 24 where they basically say well what's gonna happen at the end of the world and when you're coming and Christ says okay here it is and then Again, in Revelation, John is given more light and saying, oh, well, this is exactly what's going to happen and how it lines up. So um, it's, I'm hoping breaking the misconception that a lot of people have 
that um, revelation comes out of nowhere. Um, and that's kind of the, uh, seems to be the undertone in a lot of Christianity today. A lot of people take revelation and say, I don't understand it. Uh, there's a lot of um, commentaries, especially even in the PC Bible, where everything goes up to revelation and then stops. Um, and because people are intimidated by the interpretation of revelation and understanding. Um, but it's no different. It's interpreting scripture with scripture. We are, we are meant to understand. We are meant to glean from it. And that's, I hope to um, get from this, is that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's, that's what we're learning. That's what this is teaching us. This is, we understand that he's the only one opening the seals. That's what's been told in us told to us in Revelation chapter 4. So knowing what he is doing to the people and what he's doing to the world here should tell you more about who he is. Um, Revelation chapter 4, he starts as a lamb that has been slain. Revelation, I mean, Revelation 5, I'm sorry. Revelation 5, he's a lamb as it had been slain. Revelation 6, he is unleashing holy judgment on the world. He is showing the fullness of his character. Uh, and it kind of circles around here, especially in uh, the end of Revelation 6, where it says in uh, verse 16 and 17, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us. And these are the people hiding, the kings and great men, uh, from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? He is, again, still his... Who he looks like is still the lamb, but the aspect of who he is in this is his wrath. This is his judgment of saying, now I have come to do what I was going to do. You know, you're, you're getting what you guys deserve. This is, this is the end. This is what your sin has caused. This is what needs to be done. Because I am the lamb. Because this is who I am. I don't know how else to describe it. This is, this is what is deserved of you. And we get to see that the people, and, and I like the um, understanding or the, the differences between, it's kind of uh, beautiful in the way that they put it in verse 15, the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and free man hid themselves all in one place. The uh, discrepancies are the disparities that we create in ourselves and our own societal hierarchy becomes null and void. The kingmen were hiding with the bondmen. The great men, the chiefs, the captains were hiding with the slaves or are hiding with the, the lowest of the low, are hiding with the people that they would never associate with. But because of the wrath of the Lamb, they have nowhere to go. Um, and it's been a reoccurring theme that I've been consistently seeing in pretty much every study that we've done from when we were studying Genesis to Job to Abraham is the equalization of people. Of saying no matter what you think of yourself or what you do in your own circumstances, the Lamb is the one that puts you where you need to be. The Lamb puts you on the same plane, makes you understand who you are. Um, uh, especially in our study in Job, it was a, a, a beautiful and humbling experience to see who Job was and who Job was as a respected person of society to where he became, or uh, where he had to go to to understand who he was in place of God. In the sight of God, Job had to understand who he was. And that's the same thing that's happening here. All these uh, great and high captains and people of well-renown are all hiding in the same spot, all praying for the same thing in the wrath of the Lamb. He is equalizing them on an um, unforeseen amount of uh, wrath and judgment that we've never had to deal with before. And that's what it takes. Um, I guess that can kind of show you the stubbornness of 
myself. I won't put it on you, but myself, the stubbornness of what it takes for me to understand who he is, is usually insurmountable uh, odds and judgment, and usually it's a kick in the pants. <laughs> and this is essentially all these people saying, who can stand? Is how this chapter ends. Who can stand? Nobody. Nobody. Go ahead. Exactly. So it's an it's an interesting concept of uh, they said cowering in fear, and it's as if you didn't have the right and the proper fear that you should have had the whole time. So now I will use your human fear to make you understand who I am. Um, that's, I, I'm going to teach you, and it's something my father has covered multiple times, how fear, the fear of the Lord at the very beginning um, of, is to actually be afraid of what God can do to you is not an unhealthy thing at the beginning. You, you learn the respect later. You learn that ability to grow and to say, I, I need to understand, I don't do these things because who he is. Your faith grows in the beginning of saying, in the beginning you fear the Lord because of the consequences. Now you fear the Lord because of who he is and because you don't want to let him down. These people did not have that understanding. The world does not have that understanding of the Lord of saying, I fear him because of who he is. So he says, I can't use that. So here's what you will understand. I will hit you with literally every other aspect of your life so that you will be humbled to see who I am. Um, at least that's just a, what I see from it, at least. Um, so we see how Matthew and Revelation coincide. I hope that has been an easy to understand thing. I can give you the verses um, side by side. Um, Again, if you reach out to me, um, they uh, again to used to dispel the notion that revelation is just kind of an oddball. Um, in a lot of, if you look in a lot of historical texts and a lot of, um, it's the most debated book of the Bible. Um, there's lots of, uh, I forget the terms that where they meet together, the the leaders of the Christian church, like a, a past, there's a lot of things where they would get together. I, you have to forgive me, I can't remember the name, but when I took a, um, a synoptic, yeah, when they basically, uh, no, not, not, not a synoptic, a, uh, I have to forget, basically when they had a giant meeting with all the, the leaders of the Christian church at the time, they would say, should we leave Revelation in? That, that was conversations that were had in Christian leader past. Obviously, that's where Christ wanted it to be in the Bible. But this is a, a, such a difficult book for a lot of people that it got to the point where they're saying, well, should we even keep it in? It's going to throw way too many people off. Um, I took a Christian uh, history class, and it was really eye-opening. Um, it wasn't a religious class. It was a Christian history class. So I want to make sure that, that you understand the difference. I took a lot of the worldly look at Christianity. So it was able to get the other side of saying what had happened in our history, and these are things that had happened. So w watching the struggles that they had in um, with themselves of saying, should we keep Revelation in, should tell you how difficult it is for people to take this, um, and how easy it is for us to get in the way of what he wants us to learn. Um, so. Hopefully as we go forth, and we'll slow down and we'll go over, uh, we'll cross-reference uh, where Mima and told us in Zechariah that the, uh, the horses that are mentioned in there and what they mean individually. But this was kind of just an overview of the chapter today. Um, and I hope that we can go forward and learn a little bit more of the individual seals and what they mean um, next week. Uh, John, you mind closing us in prayer today? Father, we thank you.